Hello and welcome to Risk Factors for Venous Thromboembolism. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. What you're listening to is the video response to our two-minute EBP challenge. If you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do so. Go to edfornurses.com to subscribe. And the two-minute EBP challenge comes out every Friday. In your email, you get the question, and on Monday, you get the answer to the question. In addition, of course, there are prizes for those people who choose the correct answer. So our question this week had to do with venous thromboembolism. So let's talk a little bit about that, and first of all, the concept of venous thromboembolism, and then we'll move on from there. A venous thromboembolism is a clot that has formed in the venous system. So we used to call these DVTs. You still see some reference to DVTs in the literature. However, now we're talking about them as being venous thromboembolism. I guess deep vein thrombosis really isn't that descriptive. It can be superficial too, so now we've gone with the term venous thromboembolism. As soon as you learn the terminology, we'll change it on you again. Venous thromboembolism, of course, occurs in the vein, and one of the things that leads to the potential for a clot to occur would be the fact that the patient has valves in the veins. So what we're talking about here is going to be a venous clot, not an arterial clot. Most of the time when we're looking for blood clots, we start thinking about the possibility of decreased perfusion. Well, we're not going to get decreased perfusion with a venous thromboembolism. Remember, arterial blood flow is going to continue. It's venous blood flow that is blocked. So instead, what we might see is redness and swelling and things like that. However, Take a look at your diagram for a moment and notice that there's multiple veins coming back up into the superior or the inferior vena cava going back up to the heart. So there's multiple veins coming back from the legs. If one of these veins becomes occluded, the other veins are going to continue to take blood back up toward the heart. So what we often think about a venous thromboembolism or DVT, we think about having that red swollen calf. Well, maybe if the clot is in the calf, but most of these clots, the ones that really cause problems, are going to be clots that are occurring in the thighs and the pelvic area. And again, as you can see from your picture, there's redundancy circulation there that oftentimes is going to take that venous blood flow back up to the heart so we don't get the redness and swelling. So many of these you're not going to be able to find with your typical clinical signs and symptoms that we're used to associating with a DVT. So how do we find out who is going to be at risk for or who is going to have a venous thromboembolism. Well, first of all, we need to look for the risk factors. The most common risk factors that everybody has probably already been taught was Virchow's triad of risk factors. Dr. Virchow identified these risk factors about 150 years ago. Unfortunately, it's taken us about 150 years to figure out what they meant. <laughs> venous stasis is one. Well, 150 years ago, venous stasis meant your patient was laying in bed for like two weeks. That doesn't happen anymore. Our patients are up and ambulating and getting around. So venous stasis could be as short a period of time as about eight hours. Now that kind of redefines the whole idea of venous stasis. Your patient admitted last night could be at risk for developing a clot this morning. Endothelial injury is the second part of Virchow's triad. Endothelial injury refers to injury to the blood vessel lining, the inside lining of the blood vessel. Now, obviously, that'll happen during surgery because we're cutting through the blood vessels. Also happens with trauma and can happen in patients who have atherosclerotic disease and or sepsis. We can have damage to the inside of the blood vessel. Thirdly, we have altered coagulation. This also happens during surgery, trauma, and sepsis are some of the occasions where we'd see it. So that's Virchow's triad trying to risk factors. This is the thing we were very commonly looking for to give us an idea of whether a patient is at risk for developing a blood clot. However, there is a group now who has developed this risk factor analysis process called Q-thrombosis. And if you go to qthrombosis.org, you're going to see more information about this particular uh, risk factor analysis. What they're looking at is not just Virchow's triad of risk factors, but also additional risk factors that can increase the chance your patient's going to have a venous thromboembolism. In fact, if you go to the website and you plug in the patient's information, so the stuff we're going to talk about here, it'll give you a percentage. It'll actually give you a score of the risk the patient may have a venous thromboembolism. So let's take a look at these. 
increasing age. The older your patient is, there's a linear relationship with the increased risk of developing a venous thromboembolism. Body mass in index, also a linear correlation between an increase in body mass index and the risk of having a venous thromboembolism. Smoking will increase the risk. Hospital admission within six months, the fact that the patient has varicose veins, all these things increase the risk. Previous illness and medication. Let's take a look at some of those previous illnesses. Chronic renal failure, cancer, heart failure, COPD, inflammatory bowel disease, all of these things are going to increase the risk your patient could be developing a venous thromboembolism for a variety of different reasons. Chronic renal disease, the patient may have fluid and electrolyte disorders in addition to having possibly slow sluggish type circulation. In cancer and an inflammatory bowel disease, the patient has an immune inflammatory response occurring in the body that can make blood tend to clot more than normally would. In heart failure, we have slow sluggish circulation also occurring in our patient, and that could lead to the patient developing blood clots. And in COPD, there's a combination of factors going on there. The hypoxemia can stimulate blood clotting and also can some of the other coexisting diseases that might occur with COPD. Certain medications also are going to increase the risk for our patient. The antipsychotic medications, hormone replacement therapy, oral contraceptives, and tamoxifen. These are all medications that can also increase the risk that your patient could develop a venous thromboembolism. Okay, so if we go to qthrombosis.org, this is what the website looks like. And over on the left-hand side there, you see is the risk factor analysis model. So what you do is simply go through that and you just plug in your patient's characteristics. At the bottom, you click submit, and it tells you what the percentage of risk the patient would have for developing a venous thromboembolism. The prediction model determines a 1 in 5 year risk of developing venous thromboembolism and has been found to be fairly predictive of these uh, risk factors in your patient. Determines the patient's medication need and for need for discharge planning. So if the patient has a high risk for developing a venous thromboembolism, obviously there would be an increased risk or need for the, maybe the patient needing some kind of anticoagulant or the patient needing discharge planning and instruction for how to prevent developing a blood clot. One thing you can do is to add this link to your phone or to your computer if you use a uh, database at work so that you have access to it very easily and you can figure out your patient's risk for developing a venous thromboembolism. Okay, now why would that be important and what can you do? First of all, let's take a look at all the A's here. We got the five A's of what you can do to try to prevent a venous thromboembolism in your patient. First of all is to be aware. Be aware of the fact that patients with these risk factors are going to be at higher risk for developing a venous thromboembolism. Next is your assessment. Of course, you're going to do the assessment on your patient and be looking for these risk factors. Remember again that many times a venous thromboembolism is not going to be obvious on your clinical assessment of the patient because it's in one of the veins that has redundant circulation, so it's not causing swelling and redness and all these other things that we normally associate with a venous thromboembolism. Attention. Bring this possibility or the high risk to the attention of the physician. Maybe the physician wants to order anticoagulation for the patient if in fa fact the patient did have an increased risk. Ambulation is another thing we can do. Get that patient up and moving around. By compressing the calf muscle, it's going to push blood back up to the heart, which will decrease stasis, and it will also release enzymes that help to prevent clots from forming in the thighs and the pelvic area, those areas that are most prone to the patient having that clot release move and go back up to the lung and cause a pulmonary embolism. Lastly is anticoagulation. So we want to anticoagulate these patients that are at high risk. Well, what if the physician says, no, we don't want to anticoagulate this patient. We don't want to give him heparin because he's allergic to heparin. Or we don't want to give him some other medication because he has some underlying disease process that anticoagulation might interfere with. And that case, let's put on the SCDs. Okay, so our SCDs may be very helpful in preventing the patient from developing the clot if the physician does not want to anticoagulate. Anticoagulation is better, but hey, SCDs are better than not doing anything at all. It will help to prevent those blood clots in your patient. Thank you for joining me here for Risk Factors for Venous Thromboembolism. Join us online by going to edfornurses.com and make sure you sign up for our two-minute EBP challenge. It's right there on the homepage so that you can get these updates every week, help you to stay up to date 
in your nursing practice. Thanks again for joining me. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.